Hello friends, this is Dolores Williams of DWCB Stand Up. If we do not stand up for what we believe, who will? My sponsor helps keep this program on the air and my special sponsor is Kim Yader a peak performance coaching. If you're stuck in any part of your life on a personal or professional level, then you need to contact my personal coach, Kim Yader, and request a complimentary strategy call with my personal coach. You can reach Kim at Calendly, C-A-L-E-N-D-L-Y dot com forward slash Kim Yader. It's okay to be stuck, but it's not okay to stay stuck. And this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. If we do not stand up for what we believe, dear friends, who will? I have a special guest today, Dr. Melanie Burkholder. And I want to tell you just a little bit about her. Her resume is so long, I can't read it all. But Dr. Burkholder is a woman of God. She is a wife. She is a mother of two sons, a dedicated community leader in Carlsbad, California. She is a former special agent in the Department of Homeland Security with the United States Secret Service for almost six years. Her duties included protection details for the president, vice president, and many foreign dignitaries. Melanie is a native Tennessean and graduate of the University of Memphis with a master's in counseling education psychology and research as a and was a licensed mental health counselor. She also holds a PhD in clinical Christian counseling and works as an independent practitioner in Carlsbad. Good morning. Good morning. Melanie. Welcome to DW's View. How are you today? Well, it's just a pleasure to be here with you this morning, Dolores. You're so inspiring and I love your smile and everything. I can just see the light shining right through you. So what an inspiration. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. And we're going to go ahead and get jump right in. But first, I just had a little note I made I wanted to say about you. First, I want to thank you for your commitment to God first. And then I want to thank you for your commitment to your family and to your local church and your local community, because community, you do a lot of work, Melanie. I just want to compliment you on that. Thank you. For your service and your service to your country. So my pleasure. Yes. Now, first question I want to ask you is why did you become a secret agent? What caused you to do that? Um, well, it's kind of a funny story. I am a recovering marathon runner. I used to run <laughs> marathons and do many triathlons. Um, and unfortunately, I had major back surgery and they don't want me to run that distance anymore. But um, I was in a training run one day with my friends, uh, one of whom was the chief of police in Memphis, and one of whom was an a a AUSA, they prosecute federal crimes. And I was complaining about how I was working 80 hours a week in intensive in-home therapy uh, in an agency there in town. And I was making less with a master's degree than I made working my way through college as a bartender. So I couldn't really figure out how I was going to use my skill set and, and give back to the community and um, make it work for me as a single person <laughs> by myself and trying to make ends meet. And they had suggested that I speak with a special agent in charge in Memphis. And I went and made an appointment with him. And uh, subsequent to that, I was heavily recruited because at the time they needed uh, female agents. We had about 2,400 agents at the time, only 700 were females. So about a, a year after I had that initial meeting and, and you know, intensive background checks and all this <laughs> kind of stuff, I, I finally did receive an offer letter and I went to work in the Los Angeles field office after about six months of training. So oh, what, story, what a blessing. What a what? blessing for you. Yes. Yes. So now as a special agent for Homeland Security, um, how has that department changed since you served and would you serve again today? I was in uh, training at 9-11 and I remember we were on a break from a law class and I went out to view what we thought was just going to be regular standard news and we got the news of the uh, Twin Tower a terrorist attack and we watched it happen and I actually was the president of my class and uh, there was another class and we had lots of trainees from New York and so our initial thoughts were oh my goodness um, 
are these kids going to have to go home? What's going to be happening? You know, are their families okay? Are they safe? Many of whom had, uh, you know, moms, dads, uh, aunts, uncles in the fire department, in the police department there in New York. So um, we really banded together as a team, um, more so than before, subsequent to that. Mm -hmm. And um, what happened was a big shift in the Department of Homeland Security. We had historically been under the Treasury Department because we investigate crimes, financial crimes. Um, and so this shift from Treasury to Department of Homeland Security basically expanded our uh, duties as people now um, making sure uh, that we're catching terrorists as well and, and working with the other agencies. So um, that was very different. And it occurred on my watch, which was really interesting to see how it unfolded. Um, I have no greater uh, uh, memory of serving my country than that. And I, I was it was a pleasure to be among that men and women who are so dedicated to um, the security of the most important person in the world, in my opinion, the president of the United States, and uh, to each other in you know, executing search and arrest warrants and uh, stops, traffic stops, arrests by bus, those types of things. You have to really trust the people that you work with. And uh, I am still very close with many of them. We actually do a trivia night pretty mm -hmm. regularly on Tuesdays and uh, it's, it's fun to get together um, on Zoom to do those things and just connect and, and reconnect with those folks. And so um, it was my great honor and pleasure to do that. I would definitely do it again, uh, having given the opportunity. When I went to training, I was older uh, than many of the trainees. I didn't have any law enforcement background experience, which is kind of good, especially mm -hmm. in the realm of firearms, because they just teach you the way they want you to learn and you don't have any <laughs> bad habits. <laughs> um, but it, it was amazing to see how there were people in the classroom with me that had really wanted to do this particular job uh, all their lives since they were little kids. And, um, you know, you really can't take that for granted as someone that came in with a master's in counseling that was a, a licensed therapist as I am today. Um, it was just a great honor and privilege for sure. Oh, well, you know, God has a plan and he had a plan for you. Absolutely. And, and you executed it perfectly. <laughs> Thank so that you. is great. Now, what was your greatest threats? Uh, what are the greatest threats to our homeland on, in your opinion? And yeah. And, and also <clears throat> after you do that, tell me some of the, tell us some of the people that you protected um, while you. Yeah. Well, there, those are kind of two separate things. So I protected every president from Jimmy Carter up to uh, Bush 43 in some capacity or form. I, not that I was on their details, but they would come into town or I would go to where they were. In mm -hmm. fact, I met my husband while I was protecting the vice president, Dick Cheney, in uh, Jackson, Wyoming, which is we now have a... Um, condo there that we rent out it's our we okay. lived there for a little while and we just our kids were born there and we just love that place yeah. and actually have a son named Cheney <laughs> so oh, yeah, yeah I saw that <laughs> great honor um I actually was at the Texas Wyoming ball and the inauguration of Bush Cheney and I have their uh those bulletins and I sent them off to Cheney and he signed them and sent them back to me so <laughs> A little special thing that you can do uh, if you if you take the time to to send it off and he takes the time to write it out and send it back to you it was really nice so uh, yeah so every president's very different um, many vice presidents also and that I protected and and foreign dignitaries everyone that comes into this country uh, we also provide security for and um, uh, you know particularly during the United Nations General Assembly and things like that so it was quite interesting to do that and see all the different personalities of presidents and um, former presidents. And um, my favorite was probably Ronald Reagan, although George Bush is right up there because they're just so cute. They're so sweet and, and they have such cute relationships with their wives. But anyway, um, and I, regarding threats to the country, I think uh, being in Southern California, you know, my primary focus is on the border, having been down to the border and toured with California Border Patrol and talked with them about the needs that they have and the resources that they've been given and the resources that they yet need. Um, there's a clear uh, 
disconnect between what's happening in San Diego at the border and what's happening in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so what the Border Patrol agents want is build the wall. They want security. They want the resources they need to carry out their mission. And it's quite simply, Dolores, it's not happening right now because there is an abundance of um, unaccompanied minors coming over the border. And, we're, you know, the border agents are having to deal uh, with that in, in those uh, facilities that are overrun uh, and they can't do their job, which is to apprehend uh, criminals that are coming over the border with, for, for example, fentanyl, which is killing people left and right every day with overdose because those drugs are laced with other drugs that people cannot mm -hmm. take. And, um, the, and then, you know, the cartels love it because the border agents are distracted by an unaccompanied minor uh, care and still instead of doing the job of securing the border. So um, it's just very dangerous. And, and those poor children, you know, as a mom, I, I just think about those poor children that are being mm -hmm. sent over the border. I don't know if you saw recently, there was a video of two young girls dropped. Yes. From the, oh my goodness. Uh -huh. I cried when I saw that. I just thought I know. They, I know. they don't even, they don't know what, what is happening, where they're going, what they're doing. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's really heart wrenching and it's inhumane and it's not the way to solve anything uh, at the border. So that is primarily the, the concern that I have here in San Diego County, obviously worldwide at China. I know that our president has said that China, come on, man, it's not a big deal, but we can see otherwise with our eyes and with our mm -hmm. dollars. We know that the more we print money, the less value our dollar has, and they're going to take over and become the world power financially if we do not continue with sanctions and making wise decisions with trade with China. So those two things, I think, are huge um, concerns just for our country in general and specifically in San Diego County, Dolores. Yeah, well, that that's great. And, you know, I was just listening this morning that the cartels are making like $14 million every day because they're paid for every person that comes through that border. And it's projected, uh, we don't, of course don't know, only God knows, projected to be at about 2 million people could come into this country by this summer. And you know what I think about that too, what we, we are apprehending some of these folks, but what about the terrorists that are slipping yes. through? You know, what about those folks that we don't know? And just the idea that we don't know who's coming is yeah. just, uh, it makes us very vulnerable as a country. Where it makes us vulnerable, but but it shouldn't. Right. And and that's the crime in what's happening to America is that we are deliberately being allowed to be run over by the current occupants right. of, of of this of this country. Well, and don't you know, even get me started about how we're providing yeah. full time in person education to illegal. Oh, yeah, I know. And my children are still not full time at school in a public school system, a government run school system. So you you. There's nothing that makes sense with that. And then we have a vice president who's traveling off to Honduras and Guatemala and yet neglecting her own Southern borders. It's just, yeah. it's reprehensible. Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of a way to ignore the problem. Because if they, they did, they would have to accept well, responsibility. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and actually I think it's working just the way they planned for it to work. Yeah. So they don't want to deal with it. Now, what is the importance of Christians voting biblically? We'll get back to, jump back into some of the other things, but that is so important who we vote for. But when we say vote biblically, biblically, some people get offended by that. What yeah, do you well, mean vote biblically? I vote the way my parents voted. <laughs> that's so true. So many people don't realize that. There's a whole ball of wax here. Let's, let's just unwind this a little bit. So um, there's about 60% of Americans, which you could even draw that down to Californians that are Christian, um, about 50% of them vote. So if we had every Christian in America vote, we wouldn't be having the things that we have happen right now from 30 years of failed Democrat leadership in California, because they vote their values, they value family, they value principle, they value morality. I mean, these are very basic things, but if you vote that way, and there's no bigger example, by the way, Dolores, of how this works than the November 2020 elections here in San Diego, in, in California. Uh, all of the propositions on the ballot were conservative values, conservative leaning propositions, and every one of them passed the way that conservatives vote. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
why didn't more conservatives get elected? Well, we're bad at messaging. The, the Republicans like myself yeah. are not really great at messaging. So yeah. we need to do a better job with understand with, with having those folks understand those voters that we value the same thing. We want lower taxes. We want freedom. We want second amendment rights. Yeah. We want to have affordable living conditions and housing here. And so how do we convey that message that we aren't, you know, white KKK bigots that the media tries to portray us as? Uh, that's always been the challenge. It's a greater challenge now, and there's never a, a need greater than to get our message out to say that we actually have more in common than we have different. Yeah, you know, we do. And, and Melanie, and one thing I talked about last week with uh, Kevin is the critical race theory which is being used to, to completely divide this country and divide each American based on race. And that is big time. Every, when you look at TV, all you hear is critical race. Oh, you're racist, you're racist, you're racist. But, and you know, and some people innocently don't realize that all that's doing is planting seeds to divide and to conquer. Yeah. And it divides us from each other, makes us hate each other based on race and, and it's shameful. It is. And I think um, because they can't win with messaging and with policy, they have to create this narrative that we don't like each other, um, that people don't like each other. I mean, it's just it's it does such a disservice to us as, a, as American citizens and voters. And it's just I, I, I never will understand it. You know, I grew up in the South and, and I, I get uh, real racism. I, I get it. But I don't. I don't live there anymore for a reason, you know, there's a, there's yeah. a reason that I don't do that, but I just, I, I my kids don't even understand. They, they, they just don't even understand They're What is the deal with racism mom? Why, why is it even an issue? You know? And it's like, yeah, <laughs> they, people drive the narrative of, of the day and that's how oh, they yeah. get uh, divisiveness and it doesn't help anybody. At no, the end no, of the day. no, it doesn't. But the sad thing is, is that they're teaching it to the children yeah. from little children. Now, what you attribute the ungodly things happening across America today to God being kicked out. Basically a country founded on the Bible, on the word of God, he's been kicked out the door. And so, yeah. yes. Yeah, and you know, you have to think about why, because if mm -hmm. we have no moral compass, if we have yeah. no foundation, then what do we have? It's just the same thing as you see at the border, it's crumbling, it will yes. crumble in itself. And, you know, and also lead into things that are very dangerous like Marxism and socialism and oh, yeah. you know, taking over uh, government run everything. I had a conversation not too long ago with someone that was talking about uh, the teachers wanting childcare vouchers for their children now. And I said, well, who's gonna provide that childcare? Will it be a government run facility? Because if that's the case, you're taking away the choice uh, yeah. that we have as Americans of where to place our children, just like we have a choice about school. <clears throat> so, mm -hmm. excuse me. So, I mean, I think just overwhelmingly government intervention is, is not the way we want to go. But here in California, if you look at something like AB 276, where they require now vaccinations for your children to attend a public school, uh, my children have been vaccinated. I am a pro-vaxxer, but there are some children and examples that I know that cannot take the vaccines because they have had mm -hmm. adverse reactions mm -hmm. to it. And these people don't have a place to educate their children. I know of one particular mom who's a single mom. Her child can't take the vaccines. She works full time. She has to now educate her child. Her husband will not let her leave the state to go somewhere else where she could get an mm -hmm. education for her child. So mm -hmm. she's in a, a very difficult position to try to be the sole provider and educator for her child. And it's as a result of an umbrella um, legislation that doesn't fit all folks. And they're doing it more and more here in the state of California. You know, the party that doesn't want you to have to provide identification to vote is yeah. the same party that is working through legislation AB 663, I believe it's called in uh, Sacramento right now, that has all of our information for everyone that's ever signed a recall for oh, anything. Yeah. It will collect all of our information, personal information. How ironic is that? You don't want to provide voter ID, but when we want to recall a bad, uh, a bad politician, you want all of our information. So what do you think oh, they're yeah. going to do with that? They're going to weaponize that. Oh yeah, they'll they'll weaponize it. They say, oh, we want to contact you because you didn't know what you were doing when yeah. you signed that petition. 
So we want to make sure that you made the right decision and you knew what you were doing. Yeah. I said, you know, every person that signed that petition knew exactly what they were doing. We don't need our information turned over to, to the government against us. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that that's just another crazy thing. Now, what advice do you have um, for citizens, especially young people, when we see so many police shootings and things, and we see parents not taking responsibility, children, not, no one wants to take responsibility, but our police are under attack. And yeah, there's good police, there's bad police. And, and you know, yeah, absolutely you, you, have, you, you gotta base each case on, on what happens. And, you know, I, well, I know, yeah, go ahead with, with you being in, in, you know, in the work that you did, I know yeah. that this is, I just think it's a, there's a, a huge disconnect. I mean, people that don't, you know, even when Donald Trump said, hey, let's send social workers out on calls of domestic violence. I thought that is a horrible idea. You don't need to yeah. do that. That's a distraction from the officers mm -hmm. that need to be attending to the crime that's happening. Um, and it puts everybody else at risk, a higher risk. Mm -hmm. So uh, things like that are just not the solution. The, the, the problem is that I see and that just absolutely drives me crazy is that, you know, these talking heads, these people that have never put on a vest and wore a badge and carried a gun and wanted to protect and serve like myself, they don't understand how in a split second you have to make these critical decisions. Yeah. Um, I remember executing an, an arrest warrant in uh, Compton and uh, in LA and um my partner and I were alone. It was not a violent criminal, but what, because we know before we get there, we've done our background check, right? And, and we heard what we thought was him cocking a shotgun inside this building that he was living. And it was, it was incredibly stressful to do that. And, and we ended up not having an incident and a non-incident arrest, which was fine, but it was still, uh, you know, you're on heightened alert. And so then now this narrative of we want to have officers not armed when they're pulling a car over is a ridiculous notion because you don't have all of the facts mm -hmm. when you're doing that. You might run a plate, mm -hmm. you might get some basic information and a rap sheet, but you're not going to have all the facts. You don't just run out and willy-nilly no. execute an arrest or a warrant or a search warrant. There's a lot of background that goes into that. So um, it just puts officers at risk. And I, I wish people had a heart to understand that in every profession, there are bad apples and it's not the majority. And in fact, look at statistics. I mean, we have in California, um, fewer incidences of you know, officers shooting black people, probably because we have fewer black people. I mean, it's kind of like, what, how would it be any different? Um, there's more incidences of officers shooting white people here. So, I mean, it's not, I don't condone this shooting of anybody unless you absolutely have to. There is a use of force paradigm in every law enforcement agency in this country. And uh, we are taught how to uh, work up to that diamond. It looks like, you know, a diamond and down here would be lower level stuff and each layer as something else that you can do to, you know, prevent the ultimate use of force, which is firing your weapon. So um, I, I feel very sad for people that have lost yeah. their uh, lives and, and their families. You know, it is a, a tragic, tragic incident anytime someone gets shot, whether it's by the police or other people. But um, at the same time, you know, it's the argument is for increased resources and, and increased training exercises, uh, practice the way you play, get, uh, you know, do mm -hmm. some munitions and training. And, um, and, and that's the argument. It's not to defund the police or to take resources away because that disproportionately affects lower income people that need the police. They want the police protection. Um, so to, to have an idea that we're gonna have a country that's protected mm -hmm. without police is, is really, it, it's way out there in, in left field, in my opinion. Oh yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, when you talk about police not having a weapon, uh, anyone, all they have to do is pull up the video of, of the police officer in Nevada. Uh, I think, no, New Mexico pulled over this truck. The guy got out and just blew this officer yeah. away. Just right there on the spot, he just shot and killed this officer. That is a perfect example of why you do not have police without a weapon. They have to have a weapon. Yeah, they have to have their training. 
maybe use some alternatives so, so people are not killed, but then you, they don't know the danger that they're going into. And I think parents have to teach their children, do not run from the police, you pulled over by the police, stop. Yeah, I mean, being Hold compliant your, with the, with the yes. instructions is always ultimately going to be a much safer scenario. Um, and it's, it's a basic disrespect for authority when you have um, people that are um, not being compliant when, they're, when they have contact with police. Yeah, because that puts everyone in danger. It puts them in danger. And, and so many young people have lost their lives unnecessarily when all they had to do was comply with, with the police. Yes, and, very sad. Yeah. So anyway, oh, that's what now, as a part of your duties, um, you investigated, I know, identity theft and all those things. Uh, and I'm not going to read them all off. But the state of California has been defrauded for years, billions of dollars. And most recently, they had people stealing unemployment checks. And they were sending them out all over, not just here, but overseas. Uh, how could something like that happen and how can, how can that, I know it's happened a long time, but how, how can that be prevented? This theft, and, uh, I mean, I looked at that, so billions of dollars that this state doesn't have was stolen, basically. Yeah, well, um, no oversight in government <laughs> lends itself to uh, mistakes and in this case, millions of dollars of mistakes. And I think that's just part of when you get too much government involved in people's lives mm -hmm. then they don't have the oversight that they need and that uh, protects our tax dollars and protects um, the, the everything, I, all of us. I mean, all of our financial institutions. Um, investigating financial crimes is uh, basically, it, it could be as simple as, you know, George Floyd passed a $20 counterfeit note and it was, um, you know, known to the shopkeeper that this was counterfeit and the cops were called. And that's protocol. That's anytime someone encounters a, a counterfeit note, local PD should be called. And then uh, if it meets the threshold, it gets sent up to the federal agents like myself. And then we investigate the crime. Um, unfortunately, it didn't go that way with George Floyd. And um, we know that was the uh, catalyst, though. It was the counterfeit currency. So uh, we investigate all of that into wire transfers, into credit card fraud, um, a lot of everything that has to do with, with car money, uh, you know. And it's, it's a really fun thing to do, actually, because you can get these notes passed and then you can trace them and there's always going to be a very, very, very slight imperfection on uh, counterfeit notes because now, you know, that the dollar is made so um, uniquely that people cannot replicate it and they mm -hmm. can't possibly get everything right. And so when you find that one tiny little imperfection, you, you're like, oh, got it. Here it is. This is this note. And it goes mm -hmm. into a classification. I mean, you could call it ABC, whatever. So this is an mm -hmm. A note. And then it gets linked back up to what we call a super note, which is, um, you know, a really, really good counterfeit note. And, um, and then you can find, a, find who is producing it. So that's kind of what you do. You just dig, 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 dig and follow the money until you can finally realize who is doing uh, the counterfeiting themselves. So uh, it's, it's a fun an exciting thing to investigate, I think, but maybe most people don't think that way. <laughs> now, the, now, the Nigerians are very good at that. I, how do they get into stealing money from Americans? There's so many, there's so many, they get a printing press and they start their business. And I mean, it's, it's fascinating to even think of how do they get started because they have too much time on their hands. <laughs> they should be working someplace. <laughs> Sitting yeah. around thinking about how to defraud the government of uh, uh, thousands and millions of dollars, but you know every every arrest and investigation they did, it's just simply because they've got too much time. You need to be working, like go to work. Yeah. I'm trying to figure this out and do something <laughs> legitimate, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it's true, and there's every nationality. I mean, I swear, there's like every nationality has an attempt to. Um, uh, do identity theft or, or defraud the government or counterfeit mm -hmm. or whatever it is, bank fraud. Uh, you know, you have people receiving checks that are deceased and they're still getting cash and mm. 
we investigated all of that too. So it's different now, I would say with um, so much technology that people use. So it's a little different, but it was fun back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> was well, yeah. thanks for going into that because most people don't know that. <laughs> and that's why I wanted you to kind of cover it. But uh, now with your degrees in various levels of counseling and holding your PhD in, in clinical Christian counseling, um, are you using your counseling skills today with all the shutdowns and lockdowns? Uh, you, you're receiving a lot more work in that field. I'm telling you, it's really sad to see what is happening with people's mental health uh, these days as a result of this lockdown. I actually would never have said this you know, 20 years ago when I was working, but I'm doing a lot of online uh, telehealth now and uh, across the country because all of the restrictions have been lifted so that people can get the care that they need um, online. And, you know, sadly here uh, in North County, we just had our third or fourth suicide of um, mm -hmm. teenage kids. Um, they just can't, you know, we're not meant to be in isolation. We're not meant to be uh, alone in, in law enforcement and solitary confinement. That is not a reward, that is a punishment. And it feels like that after this time alone that we haven't been able to play sports. We haven't been able to go to church. I mean, the government has told us that we can't go out to eat, but we can go to Costco and you can go to a strip club. So I don't understand the logic in any of it. And I just have to remove that aspect of it for me to just focus on getting through each day and helping people in the community that really need uh, resources right now. And um, sadly, yes, there is an increase in anxiety, depression. If you have a child with ADHD, there's probably an increase in medication because of the screen time that they've had to use over mm -hmm. the last year with distance learning. There's a, and we've seen an increase in abuse, neglect, domestic violence, food insecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you, and you think about the uh, teachers who are mandated reporters like myself, who haven't had eyes on the students in so long, they don't mm -hmm. know what's going on. And, um, you know, it, anxiety is off the charts, you know. Um, we're trying to all just encourage people to take deep breaths to complete a routine. I mean, it's so important when you think about having your right life disrupted to this extent that you try to maintain some type of routine at home or wherever you are having to, you know, conduct your life right now. It's just, um, it's, it's, hard to think about and, and can be overwhelming. So um, yeah, the answer to your question is yes, I am seeing a lot of, and a lot of suicide ideation and suicide attempts as well. Drug use, obesity, because people are sitting at home not doing their exercises as normal or gyms have been closed. Um, you, you know, there's nothing positive about any of this. And I think on the other side of the pandemic, we're gonna see a mental health crisis um, that we're already seeing glimpses of right now and quite frankly in north county we don't have the resources that we need to provide for folks um in a, in a mental health crisis so uh pray for that one we got to pray over yeah. these folks and um you know I've, I've seen a record number of people come to counseling that have, i said they've never experienced counseling before um and, and they just need help people just yeah. need help. yeah that's sad you know and then i think of the people in nursing homes who are locked away from their families Yes, I, I feel so bad for those because that's what they depended on. That was their lifeline, the loved ones coming to see them. And, you know, when the loved one couldn't go to see them, I can imagine a lot of people having a lot of mental issues. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think about my single friends that are in their 50s, their mm -hmm. you know, 40s, 50s, they, they can't go date during a pandemic. And yeah. about, you know, the people that have lost loved ones that haven't had a proper burial, that haven't had that that process, the grief process to go through, you know, and I, I feel for all of those people at some point, the grief has to happen. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you're not even able to have a proper burial and service for your loved one, it just adds to the complication. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I was listening to Dr. Fauci being uh, questioned yesterday and he kind of wants to hold on and keep this place locked down. I don't think he wants people to, you know, the American people to, resume their normal life. Yes, we know that they, you have to be cautious with COVID and with not just COVID, but any disease. Yeah. But uh, but some people don't want to see the, uh, the economy open back up and see people resume 
their lives. And yeah, you do it with caution, but you know, I get, that's one thing I love about the American people is they know how to take precaution and they know how to be resilient at, at taking care and, you know, and being careful. Yeah. You know, when you drive a narrative that if you go out, you're going to kill grandma when you come back, mm -hmm. it doesn't go over too well with people. No. You know, we've had these face diapers on for over a year now, it yeah. seems like, and uh, I actually don't know how long it's been. It seems like it's been over a year. And, um, people were so, so compliant to that. And I, I mean, oh, I wear yeah. one when I go out, but I think, gosh, if you're compliant to that, then what else yeah. are you going to be compliant? What else, oh, what yeah. other freedoms are we going to submit to the government and that they know better than us? It's just the same thing. If I need to take a vaccine for COVID, I will, but the government should not be telling me to put something in my body that I perhaps <laughs> don't need, first of all. Um, and then it, it just, it, once the narrative is driven, I would just say it's very difficult to um, unwind it and, uh, you know, restart there. And so, of course, Fauci wants to, I mean, look at this guy. I, when he first came on TV, I said, good grief, could get, they get somebody that doesn't sound like he's about on his deathbed himself to be the spokesperson for COVID <laughs> response. I mean, he's just, this guy has very little and no power in his life. And now he has been in the limelight and he is exerting it and he... Oh, it, you know, the biggest thing he does is contradict himself. So mm -hmm. I, I just see what he says. And I think, hmm, well, yesterday you said something different. Last week, it was different. A year ago, it was different. Mm -hmm. So I don't buy into a lot of what Mr. Fauci says. And um, he, he has a, an agenda and I'm not on his train. Yeah, oh, I, I totally agree. Because, you know, a lot of people don't realize that the dangers of wearing a mask as well, and the harm that it does to our inside of our bodies, inhaling the particles in a mask, and they don't tell you about that. And, and they have people so whipped into a frenzy, like some stores you go into, no, you can't, basically, majority of places, you cannot go in if you don't wear a mask, they won't let you in. And, but, but they are damaging people with those masks. And that's another danger that's not talked about. And another, I think another upcoming health crisis with people inhaling what's in yeah. those masks. Yeah, I mean, and even just mental health issues with not being yeah. able to interpret one's face. Infants um, early on look at to their parents and, and facial expressions to interpret the world. And if they're yeah. being hidden with a you yeah. know, mask, we're not helping them uh, basically figure out life and, and what the world's alike. Like, so um, there's a lot of implications to these mask wearing. And I think it's because, you know, we're not in a a country uh, like perhaps Bangladesh or India where face coverings are normal. Um, we, we don't cover our faces here in this country. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's gonna be so many implications that, um, mm -hmm. that we don't see right now uh, that will come up later, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Now, as so looking at, looking at, your, uh, at your bio, you talked about Friday night and I kind of wanted to get on the lighter side of things and I'll here at the end have another one, but what is the Friday night lights in, um, in the Webelos, the, the, the clubs that you lead and yeah. the Boy Scouts? I kind of wanted to just kind of go over those few little things just to bring a little. Well, I'm so excited to be, I mean, I'm a Rotarian here in North County. I love my Rotary Club. We do lots to give back to the community. I was a pre presenter for an AVID uh, conference where I got to focus on what made me who I am, which is firmly faith and family. And so mm -hmm. when you started this show off this morning with faith and family, I thought, well, Dolores knows me inside and out already. <laughs> that was my whole spiel to yeah. the that I got to present to was that, you know, you can't do it alone. And uh, whether you have um, uh, religious values or not, you got to have some sort of moral guideline. You got to have some sort of moral compass and, um, you know, how you live your life. And so faith and family for me are really important. And Friday Night Lights is another uh, nonprofit that I get to be part of. And my children, they're football players. And I only have two boys. So I uh, don't have any little girls. So I'm actually the cheerleading coordinator for the, um, for the Friday Night Lights cheerleaders. And it gives me that little girl fix. I get to see yeah. them <laughs> first week, scared to say mm -hmm. my name. And by the end of it, they're performing by themselves in the spotlight and they're just wonderful. And I get to encourage them in teamwork and in uh, self-esteem and determination and confidence and all the things mm -hmm. that young girls need and young men too, but young girls as well. And so it's quite my honor to be able to be part of the Friday Night Lights 
um, organization. It's like a big family to me. And then um, Boy Scouts is, yeah, my husband and I used to be leaders when they were in Cub Scouts, but now they're big enough to be in Boy Scouts. So they have a, an Eagle Scout who is their leader now. And we just sort of exist in the background. It's really weird to think about, but <laughs> We do encourage them in their scouting adventures. I love it. It's a, a wonderful, um, a wonderful program. And uh, you know, they're also doing their confirmation classes at, at church right now, which is exciting to see them go through learning everything uh, that they need to learn about the Bible. Which uh, both of them have read their action Bibles, but it's fun to see them develop deeper into their faith during the last yeah. few years. So um, we have it. We have a very blessed life. My husband is. Um, just a, an amazing man and, and a, such a wonderful father and husband. And um, we just, we're very blessed to be able to be here in, in North County and give back. Um, one thing I did want to mention, Dolores, were you going to be talking about the non-toxic Carlsbad stuff? Oh yeah, yeah. Good. Go ahead and tell us about that. Oh, I just love this whole thing. Um, we, a few years back, actually in 2017, uh, parents uh, were alerted that the field was going to be sprayed with, uh, you know, pesticides before our field day, where the kids were literally out on the field all day long. And so um, we, we decided that was not okay. I made a quick phone call to the mayor of Carlsbad and said, this is happening and you don't want this in the press, so let's figure it out. <laughs> and so uh, we ended up not having the field sprayed that day, but then we got to, um, together, Democrats, Republicans, parents, uh, and, and said, wait a minute, why are we doing this? Why are we using Roundup? in the city of Carlsbad, there are many, many alternatives. And actually we modeled our non-toxic Carlsbad um, project after Irvine, the city of Irvine had already done it. And um, we, we talked with them, we collaborated with them. We worked with the city of Carlsbad, parks and recreations. We worked with the school district here in Carlsbad. And we asked that they not spray Roundup at the fields uh, and parks where kids play and dogs play and, uh, you know, and that's, basically all we asked for. And at the end of the day, we were so excited that the council voted 5-0 to not spray it in the entire city of Carlsbad. Mm. So we're using alternatives here and it seems to have been working out so far. We don't have any issues, mm -hmm. but um, it was just the idea that, you know, you can collaborate and work together to the greater good and, and create something positive in your community. So yeah, that was in December of 17. So we have been Pest, uh, roundup free here since then. And, you know, if I'm elected to the assembly, I would love to work with other North County cities that I would represent to, uh, if they want to do that in their cities, to help them, you know, create a cleaner environment and a safer space for children and animals to play. I think that's so important, especially living here in the coastal community where our watersheds need to be protected as well. So. Yeah, you know, that, that sounds like something that should be promoted throughout the city, throughout the state. Yeah, you know, some of these people in Sacramento with all this craziness coming out of there, they need to be talking about something like this, something positive, positive. That's helpful and something that's not tearing up the state and destroying the state, you know. Yeah. And, you know, as Republicans, um, I, you know, we tend to get a bad rap with uh, the environment. And I don't really understand that because the environment yeah. affects all of us. Uh, yeah. But, it was a wonderful project and I was so pleased to have been part of that movement and met some really wonderful people through it. So, yeah. Now, I, I, I know I was going to ask you, now, I know that you ran for office uh, before. Now, you planning to run again. Yes, what, do you know what, what uh, will you be running for? Yeah, so we launched the campaign, I think, two days ago, three days ago. Melanie for assembly.com is the website. Oh, okay. Melanie for assembly.com. This is the California State Assembly in the 76th District, which is North County, San Diego. So it includes Encinitas, Oceanside, Carlsbad, Vista, and Camp Pendleton. Uh, quite a large district, but um, you know we have um, a Democrat incumbent. This is her second term, and I ran against her last time. And we had a very, very, actually the most competitive race in uh, California, uh, in San Diego County, and I think in California, actually. So we intend to come out this time and, and really um, focus on what we did or what we could do better and, and uh, you know, expand the door knocking and, and the making the phone calls. And, uh, you know, the, at the end of the day, she raised about $3 million in special interest money from the California Teachers Association mm -hmm. who want to rule our state and, uh, you know, SEIU union, just okay. a lot of union 
money went into her campaign. And so we could not compete with that. I raised 250 or $300,000, which is a, a lot of money, but um, I couldn't compete with that. And so this time we're gonna do things differently and uh, we're gonna get out there and work uh, You know, every day to that end. I have been so focused on uh, getting my kids back in school. I'm a co-director mm -hmm. for the Parent Association here in North County, a co-founder for the Carlsbad Families for Reopening Schools. Uh, I did some mental health consultation, co consulting with a Let Them Play group, and now I'm a co-founder for the Let Them Breathe group. So we want to get these masks off of these children yeah. and uh, let them have a healthy environment while they're at school. And um, I've been working on that for the past year and a half, it seems as though, uh, you know, and, and I think I had my first rally to open schools in September. Uh, right after, you know, they said, let's do two weeks to slow the curve. And then they were going to open schools in August. And th as soon as they said they weren't opening schools in August, I knew it was a bunch of baloney to begin yeah. with. But uh, then we started rallying the troops. And now mm -hmm. we are, uh, you know, the disposition in the kids, all of them, not just mine, but it, the disposition is just so positive. They're so happy to be back with mm -hmm. their stu fellow students. And um learning in person, we saw an increase in D's and F's over the same grading period, oh, wow. 300, over 300% increase because of distance learning. So it doesn't work. And of course the teachers are fighting us tooth and nail because yeah. you know, why wouldn't they want to continue to teach? Oh, yeah. um, but we're, we're doing it the right way. We sued the state, we won and we're going to keep pressing, you know, now it's getting them back in not only full-time, but having lunch at school because apparently COVID mm -hmm. knows if they're eating at, at yeah. Con yeah, that's great. You, you know, we will have to definitely keep you lifted in prayer yes. and do all we can to help you because you would certainly be a great alternative for that seat. So we'll definitely keep you lifted in prayer. Thank you. you now, um, this last thing I wanted to ask you is what concerns you most about the direction that our country, we talked about the border. Now that Supreme Court is also under attack, as well as the Constitution, every part of the founding of this country is under, under attack. I'm very concerned about this push to take over the Supreme Court and HR1, we can, I know we can't cover all of that, but HR1, people need to know how dangerous that is to our elections. I mean, with no accountability complete and total power over our elections where we have no nothing to say, but we just do what we're told. HR5 would destroy is sexual legalization and will we destroy our Christian Christianity, what Christians stand for, that will come back and be under massive attack in the, and with the gun control and all the stuff, you know, and, and, and I just want to say this, uh, Melanie, we talk about guns, president talks about uh, gun control, but you know, one thing they never talk about is God. They never talk about putting God back into America. They never talk about faith and what it takes for people to live a, a, a normal life, a godly life, which, you know, when we put the Bible in schools, when we put the Bible in places where it needs to be, crime goes down when mm -hmm. people hear the word of God and when they know the word of God, and when they're taught the word of God. So just, you know. I think, um, Dolores, there's an inherent feeling of altruism if you have god in your life there is a, there's just uh you want to do good and you want to help other people and you know it's not because you feel guilty if you don't it's because you genuinely want to be the light of the world you want to be the light that god asks us to be and shine on to others and and when you take that away you take away a level of accountability for people um accountability to each other and uh, I, I think that is the beginning of the crumbling of a democ democracy, um, because if, if you're just telling, if the government is just telling us how we have to conduct our elections, how we have to refer to people and call them and what names we can call them and how we have to identify people and categorize everyone, you know, you're taking away the uniqueness that God made us, each of us individually, just our certain way. We're not one of us are alike. And, and I think that is just so important for people to um, embrace and appreciate instead of try to put everybody in a category where they fit, because it's coming to the point of then at birth, are we going to be assigned a future career? Well, you look like a, um, you know, 
widget maker. So you're going to be a widget maker. You know, is that what the government is going to end up doing? And, Mm -hmm. you know, if you read books like Brave New World and 1984 and some of these classics, you really think um, we're not far from genetic engineering and we're not far from the government telling us every aspect of our life. So that's what happens when you take God away. You take away our individuality. You take away our spirituality, our altruism, our accountability to, to each other and our love. And, and that is just not a society I want to live in. And I don't think most people do either. No, they don't. Take the masks off the kids. Take those masks off the little children. I see little two-year-olds, one-year-old. They got a mask on a baby. I said, what? Get those masks off the off of these children. You're yeah. harming them. Leave them alone. <laughs> Let them be kids. Exactly. You know, stop indoctrinating these babies into sex and trafficking. And and you know, I, I know we're going to end soon, but I'm concerned about you know all the children, Melanie, that are coming in, into this country by the thousands, thousands, thousands. They're hiding them out in these different bunkers and in little caves and whatever they're putting them in. They don't want anyone to know what's happening in there with these children. Some of them, these children are being abused. They're being raped, little girls. And, and that one little boy also was sad that was in the desert. They found him by himself in the desert. And it was so sad. It just, you know, just breaks your heart what's happening. But you know, God is in control. And uh, that's where we find our solace and where we find our comfort and peace and knowing that he's in control and he's watching everything. You know, Melanie, yeah. this is what people that have no faith in God don't realize. Every single thing we do is recorded. He's watching it all and he'll judge it all one day, you know? Uh, amen. Yeah. So, amen. Yeah, so go ahead and have your final words to us, Melanie. Share with us and let us know how people can contact you if you want them to contact you. And I'm going to actually just do a prayer at the end after I do my closing. Yeah. So. Well, it's been just a pleasure to be here having this conversation with you. Some tough questions, some fun questions, and some yeah. knowledgeable uh, questions. And I really appreciate that. I um, am so excited to be running for the state assembly to try to give um, back to the community and, you know, some of their power, some freedom, some um, uh, level of accountability to politicians in Sacramento who have really just taken the power away from the people. We, we When you think about things like AB5, where you can't even, you know, you have to unionize all the labor in this state to, to work. You can't work where you want to work, for whom you want to work, and when you want to work, because some politicians want unions over individuality and individual choice. Um, I, I would fight that tooth and nail. Like, that's not something where I want people to have to do things. You can't be an independent contractor anymore. Why not? You know, come on. So um, taking that fight to Sacramento is, is going to be my pleasure. I would do the same, take the same fight to Sacramento that I took to the bad guys on the streets of LA when I was a Secret Service agent. And I know how to compromise and, and talk with both sides of the aisle. It's, a, it's an important uh, I'm a therapist. That's what I do is, is listen and talk to people. So um, usually when you're sitting in front of me, it's not because you're having a real good day. So we're, uh, we're able to, to make ends meet there and um, do what's the greater good for this, for this uh, district in North County and recognize that what's right for here is not always right for, you know, Chula Vista or, you know, that, that district, the 79th, it's not always the same in each district. So Mm-hmm. I would protect the rights of people in North County. Uh, and and that means property values, property rights. And, uh, you know, they just passed in San Diego, Todd Gloria just passed this ridiculous vacation rental um, where the folks that have property can only rent their house out. I think it's for 30 days of a calendar year or something like that. It's like 1%. So it's really detrimental to the economy. The transient occupancy tax here in North County is as considerable for our economy. Now, mm-hmm. Number one in, in, in San Diego County is San Diego, the city of San Diego. Number two is Carlsbad. So the TOT is very important uh, to us up here. And that goes back to protecting property rights uh, mm-hmm. of people. And, you know, the biggest things are getting schools open and getting businesses open. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to continue that message and, and protect and, and help our veterans. I don't know if you know, but every month I go out to the Veterans Association here in North County oh, with some folks and pass out food uh, to veterans. It's, it's like yeah. the, my favorite day of the month. Yeah. And, uh, 
if you want to join me doing that, I would encourage it. It's the first Friday of every month. Uh, we go out and pass out food. Oh, are, what time do you go? I usually go at one o'clock. Oh, okay. I, I keep that in mind. You have to let me know details. Yeah. And if you want to uh, email me, Melanie for and um, that would be, that's my website. You can email me through there and um, let me know if you'd like to get on board and help this campaign. We are always going to love our volunteers and uh, get them to work. You make phone calls or knock on doors or whatever you want to do. Certainly donate. That's always a help. You know, $5 goes a long way in a campaign. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's how you can reach me. Really, we, we want to um, have an overwhelmingly positive message. It's not that uh, we don't like, uh, you know, something. It's that we want to help you and value you and uh, show that to each other. You know, I've not seen my opponent this whole time of COVID. She once mm -hmm. said on a call that she wants everyone in the world vaccinated before opening schools and businesses. Everyone in the world. So oh very different perspective uh, mm. than and uh, like taking away. I mean, can you imagine how long it would take to get everyone <laughs> vaccinated? Uh, well, well it's, it's, I mean, it's a personal choice and, and no one should be saying that. And, I, and, and see, this is how people get indoctrinated into falling for the lie that everyone has to be vaccinated. I talked to an aunt in Texas, my aunt Fern, I'll call her. And she said, well, we don't want people to come to church unless they've been vaccinated. And that's, you know, that's indoctrination. This is how they get people to, it's like communism is what it is. Everyone thinks that you have to be vaccinated on a vaccination passport. You can't go anywhere unless you show you've been vaccinated, but they don't even know what's in the vaccination. No. They don't know what they're putting in their bodies. And, um, and I don't say that, you know, in a critical way, because people are trying to do all they can, what they think to help themselves and protect themselves from COVID. Yeah, but um, but they don't know what they're putting in their bodies, and everyone should have a personal choice whether they want to do that. And um, yeah, so <laughs> thank you for sharing, Melanie. I really appreciate it, and I'm gonna just thank my audience for coming each week. I really appreciate you for listening to these podcasts each week. I I, I never take it for granted. Um, this is only by the grace of God that I'm here. And to my friends, please subscribe to my channel and share this podcast when it comes out each week. Share it with your friends and we'll notify you when it when it's gonna come out. Um, I'm just humbled today and, and just thanking God, you know, for this day. And um, if you wanna sponsor my show, we'd love to have you be a sponsor. And my call to you today, dear friends, is to stand up, stand up for what is right and what is right with God. Because you know what? If we don't stand up, who will? Melanie, close us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us and uh, you provided for us, Dolores, who called by, uh, called by you to, to share her word, a good word with uh, her viewers and her listeners. And let us, let us just be humble and hear uh, the positive things that are going on in this world. Let us recognize that we are there is more good than bad in this country in this world and let us be the light that shines to other people so that they have the faith and that they know that you are the light of the world and let us come to you with our problems and uh, ease our burdens and carry the heavy load for us lord we know that you can do all things and we know that because it says it in the good book of god of uh, the bible and so we just thank you for that we thank you for our time together today please bless us for the rest of this day and until we meet again in your heavenly name we pray. Amen.